courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another NHL season's in the books. Another year of no Flames playoff hockey is also staring us down the face. Um, as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, just because our last show of the season, I also want to give a shout out to Peter Marino, the guy that people don't see. He's our editor behind the scenes, our producer. Those of you that came to hang out with us for our trivia night at Bow River met him. Otherwise, he's a mystery to everybody else, but a big part of our team. So I want to shout him out. How are you doing, Matt? Oh, good. Uh, Glad that the season's finally come to its conclusion. Um, You know, it was a long season, but not a bad season in my opinion, and it just, you know, got to focus on the next stages of things and the draft, free agency, and all that kind of fun stuff. You know, you and I talked early in the season about how this season was going to go one of two ways. It was either going to be that they try to make a run for the playoffs with the guys they've got and get them re-signed, or they move all their free agents and go into a retool. And we didn't know for probably a good half the season which way they were going to go. As soon as the, I'd say the Elias Lindholm trade was made, we knew which direction they were going. And while it might have hurt, you know, in the present, I think to get done what they had to get done, they did well. Yeah, and I recall us mentioning that, like, this season would have only been a fail if they had not... uh, managed to trade off the impending free agents. Yeah. If you tried to make a run and then you lost all those guys for nothing. Yeah. Or if they signed them, that also would be okay, but they clearly decided to sell either way. You know, they did not lose the assets for nothing. So therefore it's a successful season. Well, let's look at the last two games of the season that the flames played and how they did there. Um, We had, the Calgary Flames taking on the Vancouver Canucks in Vancouver on April 16th. A big 4-1 win for Vancouver. This one uh, was the game that made Vancouver clinch first in the Pacific. What were your thoughts on this game? Uh, one team was largely disinterested and the other team wasn't. <laughs> um, it's kind of what you expected for a game where, I mean, Calgary's way out and Vancouver's playing for something. Yeah, exactly. Like, Vancouver wanted to clinch first, which I don't blame them, because it's a lot easier to play um, Nashville than it is L.A. And, you know, it made sense that they would be going for it, and Calgary is kind of just there. So, you know, there's not, like, Calgary has a ton to play for either, so, you know, it just made sense that the talent level and effort would lend it the one way and it did adam Klapko is in the lineup for the flames in this one making his his regular season nhl debut um otherwise the only goal really for the flames came from Braden pacall which is not something i ever thought i'd say yeah and i thought calgary didn't play like extremely terribly or anything like that it's your typical flames against a good team game yeah and Exactly. They tried, but talent is the difference. Um, well, I I was right with the predictions this week, and as we move into the very last game of the season at the Cell Dome, the Calgary Flames took on the San Jose Sharks. And, you know, as much as I predicted a win here, in the back of my mind I said, this is going to be terrible. This is going to be an absolute nightmare here for uh, the Flames because we know how they play against bad teams. And somehow the Flames managed to beat the worst team. And in very convincing fashion, too. They were up 5 nothing until like nine seconds left in the game. Uh, yeah. Spoiling Dustin Wolf's first career shutout. But uh, that's the worst no, part the Flames, like, Dustin uh, Wolf, the Flames, after, especially after this, deserved a shutout. Yeah, they, they just completely dominated this game. And uh, San Jose really did not have any sustained pressure at any point in the contest and um like if we think calgary's bad san jose is on a completely different tier of awful yeah i mean you know and i was having this discussion with actually somebody after this game i said we think that we're bad and i think the flames can get out of this rebuild with ever being without ever being san jose bad yeah like san jose realistically like if you took out any of the good players like Coleman, Backlund, Kadri, Uyghur, Anderson, Huberdo, 
uh, Kuzmenko, Sharon Govich. If you took all those guys and replaced them with basically AHL call-ups, that team would still be better than what San Jose is right now. And I think San Jose did what we were worried the Flames might do, right? I think they ran a lot of veterans till the very end because they're trying to make the playoffs every year. They traded their picks. They didn't have a lot of futures. And now they're regretting it. Yeah, and it's going to be probably eight or nine years until San Jose cobbles enough of a team together to actually become relevant again. And it's going to be a long time in the wilderness for them. I was going to say what Flames players got points in this game. The question is what Flames players did not get points in this game. Jonathan Goudreau got no points. Michael Backlund got no points. Sharon Govich got no points. Kadri got no points. Pakal got no points. And Soloviev got no points. Otherwise, everybody else gets a point. Yeah. Um, nice to see Adam Klapka score. Obviously, the AHL call up there. So, uh, His first and- NHL goal. Yep. Goals and it was nice to see Blake Coleman and Mackenzie Weger getting 30 and 20, respectively. Yeah, and, uh, you know, breaking some personal records, breaking some league records. That's always nice as well. So we got goals from Blake Coleman, Kevin Rooney, Adam Klapka, Mackenzie Weger, and Oliver Shillington in this one. As Matt mentioned, almost a shutout for Dustin Wolf against his hometown team. Um, didn't quite get it, but we'll call it a shutout. Let's just yeah. round it up. Well, frankly, uh, Pospisil getting that penalty at the end on a a slash where he didn't actually hit anybody with his stick was kind of a dubious call in the first place. So, you know, if it wasn't for that, it sounds they wouldn't have had a power play and they wouldn't have scored. So, you know, chalk the lack of a shutout due to poor refereeing on that call. Pospisil probably owes uh, Dustin Wolf a bottle of whiskey or something now. Yep. Um, well, Matt, that wraps it up. And if we look back at the prediction game, neither of us did great this year, but um, I thought I might be like Dustin Wolf and almost get the shutout. I think there's the first year I've got a shutout. I won three to one all year. Yep. So we have, what, 25 weeks that we predicted, which is crazy that we can only get three of them right. But, I mean, that's 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 the Calgary Flames for you. Well, this year has been unusual in the amount of like win five, lose five, win five, lose five that they've been through up and down all year. Like there, there's really been no constancy or variation to their game. It's either one or the other. And like when the switch is off, they're really terrible. And it, when it's on, they look like they could beat anybody. And you know, and that, uh, them finishing with the ninth worst record is about appropriate for their overall play. It is. So the Calgary Flames finish now uh, fourth from the bottom in the Pacific Division. So they have the Kraken, the Ducks, and the Sharks below them. Their final record after 82 games is 38 wins, 39 losses, five overtime losses for a total of 81 points. Um, so 90, what, 98 points was the last playoff team. So the Flames a fair bit of a way out of the playoffs. And as Matt said, they end with the essentially the ninth worst team. So they, they have the ninth best odds to win the lottery. Yeah. And realistically, they're going to pick probably ninth or 10th um, in the draft upcoming. And that's about it. Let's talk about the draft when we get closer. I think the uh, we should move to exit interviews. If you haven't watched these and you want to, they're all on YouTube, on the Calgary Flames YouTube channel or on the website too. But some, I would say some really interesting discussion this year and a much different vibe than last year. If you remember last year's exit interviews, everyone was upset. Everyone was sad. Everyone was you know unhappy. You could tell the Daryl Sutter experiment didn't work out. This year, surprisingly, after a, I would say a worse season, It seemed like a lot more optimism. Well, and I think that has a lot to do with the shifting of personnel, frankly. And, like, the Flames saw a lot of older guard people move, uh, save uh, Backlund and Mangiapane um, and Anderson. And most of everybody else has moved on uh, from the older guard. So, you know... I I think that's part of it, but I also think that, I mean... The Flames did what they set out to do this year. Last year, they didn't. Last year, they are trying to be a playoff team, and they weren't. I think they did exactly what they set out to do this year. And, you know, while it might not be where some of the players want to be, I think that you have to say, you know, wow, we did it. And, you know, we see the path forward. 
Yeah, then it, it's looking a little bit better, and there is some actual optimism, but, it, you know, it's one of those where, like, this is not going to be a playoff team next year. Um, and, like, it, we're probably going to be as bad, if not worse, next year as well. So it, it's one of those where... Uh, you have to look for the positives on the smaller scale, uh, so that way they build towards more positives in the bigger scale. Well, let's talk about some of these interviews here. Uh, we'll start with the GM, Craig Conroy. Craig Conroy came out and pretty much said that, um, you know, if they are doing any additions, they're not going to do any seven-year contracts. I think you and I would probably agree that's the best thing right now. When he talked earlier in the season, he talked about, you know, that they could be active in free agency, but they're going to be looking for two to three year contract transitional guys. I think that's the right way to go for him. What about you? Yeah. Like realistically, this team's not going to be able to get the upper end talent that they need, um, with any ease. And so it's going to be a transition. Like you're going to have to grow those people internally and, you know, have like the Connor Zaris of the organization, take that next step and become those uh, higher quality guys internally. And you kind of are in a stopgap mode uh, for the time being. And uh, realistically, like this team uh, can sell itself as a place to go for a pending UF or potential UFA in that, you know, come here, you're going to get a good opportunity to, you know, be on a top pairing or top uh, forward line, uh, you can pad your stats, and at the trade deadline, we can always flip you. And, you know, like, th those kind of things do matter. And, you know, like we saw with uh, Vladimir Tarasenko, for example, signing with Ottawa, um, he ended up getting dealt and is succeeding where he is. Well, and, I, and I even think Kuzmenko becomes a, an example like that, right? He didn't look good in Vancouver, came here, in a different environment, and he's looking really good for the Flames. Yep, and whether you keep those kind of guys for a bit or you flip them and get more draft capital, either way, you know, especially with the amount of return that the Flames got for the UFAs that they had, the more bullets you can fire at the target, the more darts you can throw, all of it, you know, it, the more you chances you have, the more chances you will to get those guys that you need uh, five, six years from now as you're trying to come out of the rebuild fully. Yep. Um, d we finally heard from Conroy, I guess, what his vision of this retool is. And if you haven't heard it, it's interesting. Conroy talks about the difference in his mind between a retool and a rebuild. And he said with a rebuild, you're tearing it down to the studs. That's not his intent here. He looks at the Dallas Stars model as his uh, model for what he wants to do here. And they had a really good draft or two. I mean, that 2017 draft was really good for them. They had some good UFAs. They made some good trades. And he looked at that Dallas model as the, you know, what he wants to do. And when you look at teams that have done that, I mean, like anything, there's good and there's bad. There's some like Dallas that have worked. There's also some teams I can think of that haven't worked when they've tried something like that. So I think that it's a good model to follow and it gives us some idea of where this is going. Um, but, you know, that is, I think, a good model to look at because what was it? That 2017 draft, they had Heiskanen at, at third overall. And otherwise, they just had a really good draft. And the Flames don't necessarily need that this year. But I would say between this year and next year, one of these, they're going to have to have a really good draft if that's the model they want to use. And I think they need to get even more picks to make that work. Well, and that's the key there. And, like, Dallas was able to transition their team via trading off a bunch of pieces, getting a bunch of draft picks, and then actually hitting them. Um, you know, and it, it's one of those that, like, Calgary, like, if we're talking, like, a shorter timeline... Like, realistically, you're going to need to get, like, a Johnny Gaudreau caliber guy from the second or third round who walks in and is one of your star players, just like Jason Robertson and Rupe Hintz were for Dallas. And, you know, the, each of them was a second and a third round pick, and, like, they're literally Dallas's two best forwards. So, you know, it, it's one of those where 
in theory yes but in practice you have to have some major horseshoes um, everything's gonna have to, to line up just right yeah and like you know like frankly looking at like the flames internal cupboard right now like i don't see anybody that's of that upper tier uh, in the organization right now uh on forward or defense like where they're uh you know f first line all-star or a first pairing defenseman i don't see anybody right now organizationally so it's gonna take a bit for this team to you know either have guys like pospisil who kind of came out of nowhere to be a, become a very valued pe uh piece of this team or you know you're gonna be there for a few years as like your first round picks start to pile up and you know you transition that way and yeah, real I and realistically, with Huberdo's uh, ten point five eating, uh, you know, an eighth of the co uh, the cap, like it, it's going to be hard for this team to fully transition over the next few years anyway because of that. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm not saying they will or won't be able to do it. Um, I don't I don't know yet if they will or won't. But I think that now that we know the model that they want to follow, it helps us sort of. Track their progress, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where, like, that's where I tend to look more at, like, uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, which is kind of a similar vein of things um, where, like, the, they would trade their guys like their Lindholms and their Hannafins and their Tanevs. Talking about the baseball team now. Yes. Uh, for you know, the equivalents, the baseball equivalents of those players for a bunch of prospects and would flip, you know, and let those guys grow into the organization and, you know, just keep flipping like indefinitely and until like they're an elite team. And they've basically been one of the best teams, even though like their payroll is nothing because they keep just flipping everybody and, until, you know, they get the star guys that they want and Calgary I think needs to basically follow the same procedure that they had for this year and just keep flipping guys um for more draft capital and whatever prospects and keep going yeah and you can't get too attached to those guys like you said you've almost got to bring them in get them where you need them and then even if they're young guys still be willing to flip them yeah like realistically anybody that's older than Anderson and even he's walking that line like you should not really be tied to long term and you know maybe Kadri and that's about it like anybody else beyond that not so much and like you need guys all in that you know 20 to 25 age group um to be your core of your team moving forward and we only have a couple of guys currently that are in those spots, so we need to just keep adding and adding and adding until... Conroy did mention he wanted to go out and get a guy in his you know, early to mid-20s. That's hard to get. I think we all know that. Um, but he said that's really the piece that he felt they couldn't get this year was that player in their early to mid-20s who's already a roster player. Yeah, and you you've seen that before with like Montreal trading their first round pick uh, to get Kirby Doc. Yeah, and he referenced that. Yeah, and you know uh, the um, Capitals uh, getting uh, that guy from Toronto, uh, Sandine, uh, who's been really good for them as well, and you know, or uh, uh, Vancouver getting Ronick off of uh, the uh, Red Wings and. You know, it's one of those where I don't think Calgary's in the right spot this specific season for that kind of trade. But I think they have to be opportunistic uh, over the next couple of seasons. And if there's a situation where they can snag one of those caliber of guys, um, and it makes sense. Uh, Just because they have assets, the first doesn't necessarily mean the best way to use the first is to make it. True. To make and it. Yeah, and it largely depends on the caliber of the draft mm -hmm. and, and, and. And um, 
the main uh, concern I have about that with doing it sooner than later, is, frankly, is that the flames do not have anybody in the cupboard right now of a high tier. And uh, I think that, like, they need to start drafting those guys. And I think, like, the flames realistically need to make up for the number of years where they didn't have very many good draft picks by making as many as possible to try and... Uh, right the ship a little bit for all of that. We'll see which way they go with that. Again, we don't know how this will turn out or even, you know, who might be available for the Flames yet, and we'll talk more about the draft when we get closer to it, but now that yeah, we know like the, the, one the thing model that, they want to follow, we can kind of see how they're doing with that kind of model. Yeah, the one thing I would hate to see is this team kind of try to short uh, circuit the actual process by trying to leap ahead of where they actually are. I don't get any sense they're going to do that, though. Uh, well, and how would you say they're, over the last, well, since they won the Stanley Cup, it's basically been the same feedback loop of, oh, well, we're bad, let's try to short circuit things to get there as fast as possible, much to the team's overall detriment. Yeah, but and I don't think they've ever come out like they have this year and said we're in a retool. And I think True. by doing that, you're coming out and saying, we need time to do this. True. And it, I just hope that they hold the course and do things properly. And I think rushing. as long as Conroy is the GM, they will follow the plan that he's laying out. True. Uh, Ryan Huska also spoke, said that playoffs are the goal for next season. He actually felt that if they didn't lose some of their veterans this year, they could have made the playoffs. I think a lot of that is probably just, you know, trying to get the guys excited for next year. As you've said, I don't think they'll be close to the playoffs, but I think it's a great goal to go in with your players. We've heard Conroy say he doesn't want to create a losing environment here. Um, Kuzmenko was a big improvement on the power play. There's a lot of talk about how the Flames power play didn't look good at the beginning of the year. He feels the Pospisil was one of the guys that helped the Flames get out of the early season funk. And also interesting to hear from the coach that he feels Jonathan Huberto may have stepped back as an offensive player, but is a better overall player now. I think that the the uh, other side of his game, the defensive side, has taken a step forward. What do you think about those comments? Well, I, I think the uh, playoffs being the goal next season is something that I think that, like, you're never, like, even San Jose is going to say that. Even though, like, realistically, there's no hope in hell that the Sharks ever go anywhere near that. <laughs> um, and I think that the Flames, it, you know, it's a good goal to have, but um, the odds are not very strong in their favor. I thought Kuzmenko basically uh, has been the best offensive player for the Flames since uh, Kachuk and uh, Goudreau left. And, uh, you know, having somebody who can actually score on the power play is a novel concept for this team over the last two years. So I, I agree fully with that, too. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think giving credit to Pospisil for getting them out of the funk, I think him and Zari together, that youth infusion when we saw that, it felt different on the lineup. So I totally get that. And... I think good for the coach for maybe redirecting a little bit on the Jonathan Huberto thing. I mean, we all know, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we get to our predictions. We all know these not having the seasons that we want him to have here in Calgary. So I think good for the coach to kind of say, Hey, this guy is valuable in other ways. And that's what you want out of a head coach. True. Uh, Kadri spoke. It was interesting to hear Kadri speak. The media asked him, do you want to be here for this? Are you wanting to stay through a, uh, uh, rebuild. Now, of course, no player is going to come out at exit day and say, no, I don't want to be here. I'm never going to see you guys again. See you later. I'm out. Um, but he did say he chose Calgary before he came here. He had other options and he picked the flames. Um, he wants to stay. He likes Calgary. He likes being here. He likes the city. I know some people have said, why would he want to go through this? And I think it'd be different if he didn't have a Stanley cup, but I can kind of see Kadri saying, you know what? I'm in my you know mid to late 30s, but depending on what the year is that he says it. I have my Stanley Cup. I've got a good contract here in Calgary. My role has changed. I'm going to stick around and sort of you know become that veteran guy to these young players. I can totally see him b embracing that role. Well, and realistically, um, frankly, the team was looking like it was more of a playoff team when he signed here than what it yep. is 
But also, for somebody who has a young family, Calgary, frankly, is a great place to be, uh, to raise children and all of that. And, you know, I, like he, he already has a Stanley Cup, as you mentioned, and I think that, you know, the family side of things matters more to him now, which makes a, lot, a ton of sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that, it, yeah, like you said, it makes sense to stay here, too you know, want to have your kids grow up here. And I think one thing we don't re think about too is like you said, the family, right? And he's got a young kid. He's got his wife here. It's going to take a toll on your family to up and leave in a year or two. So, you know, as a guy who's kind of got what he wants, he knows his family's going to be secure. He's got a good contract. I could see if I was in that scenario, making the same decision and just saying, you know what, this, it totally makes sense for me to just play out this contract here. Keep my family here. My kids have friends and that sort of thing in the, in the city. Let's just stay here and hopefully we can get back to it. I think it'd be very different if he didn't have a cup, but if that's the way he's feeling, I, I totally get that. Yeah. And like, that's not to say that like he might not necessarily get traded in the future or whatever, whatever, but for at least like right now in the short term. Yeah, I guess you know, I'm saying he's he's probably not going to Conroy this offseason saying get me out of here. Yeah. And like there have been players before with in other team situations where they do go to the general manager and say, Yeah, you know, I signed here for this team to be one thing. It's not let me yep. go. And that yeah, would and, be and perfectly I be fine. If one or two of the players on this team said that. Yeah, you know, and that would be perfectly fine if he wants to at any point. Um, but I, frankly, I'm th thankful that he's here. He's been a very good mentor to both uh, Zari and Pospisil this season, and you know, I, I I like his presence in the lineup. So you know, I'm hoping that he stays here for a while. Me too. Uh, Dan Vladar spoke. Interesting to hear from the backup goaltender we haven't seen in a while. He said he's ahead of schedule with his recovery. Even Craig Conroy said that his hip's feeling good. Uh, Vladar thinks that he should be skating again in July and should be back for training camp. He also mentioned that he'd been playing through a hip issue for about a year, which I thought was kind of interesting. I mean, you know, this is a guy who obviously had a spot in the NHL and we thought was looking good at times. And if what we were seeing was Dan Vladar working through something with a hip, I'd really be interested to see what healthy Dan Vladar looks like. Well, and that's the thing. Like, last year in the early part of the year, he was fantastic. And then struggled in the very end of the season um, when he would play. And then he was just okay through this season. And it's like, well, if when he trended down last year, um, was that coinciding with his hip injury? And... You know, like, we might have only seen, like, him at his peak for, you know, the couple of months where he was actually a dynamite goaltender. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see if he's healthy next year. Uh, like, I would not be opposed if uh, it breaks out that way with uh, Vladar and Wolf as the tandem next year. Good problem to have, right? Is to have too many goaltenders. Mm-hmm. Um, Craig Conroy mentioned that he talked to Oliver Shillington and Oliver Shillington says that he wants to continue to play hockey. So Conroy will engage with his agent. Um, we've talked a lot about Shillington. I think he'll be back. I mean, you know, we've talked about, I'm not sure anyone's going to take a chance on him there, but I'd be surprised if Oliver Shillington's not a flame next year. Yeah. I, I think that like over the next two weeks, you'll have a random, a uh, day where you'll see news flames have signed Shillington to like a one or two year deal for whatever. Yep. Yeah. You know, and yeah, you know, I, I would be surprised if by the draft it wasn't done. And then the big one that the media is talking about is Markstrom and, you know, Markstrom didn't say anything. And again, you're not going to get a guy to come out here and say, you know what? I've told the GM, I don't want to come back. I'll never see you guys again. Have a nice life. Like let me he, the f out of here. That's right. I mean, you're you're not going to do that, especially a, a veteran professional who's looking for a new home. You don't want to, you know, other GMs say, "Wow, this guy's burning bridges." So, no. you know, I I don't know what people were expecting out of this interview, but Markstrom, when asked about next season, pretty much said, "I don't know," and he said he's talked to Craig. Um, the media did try to sort of ask him about, "Were you ever told you were going to go to New Jersey?" 
you could tell that there's some frustration in his voice about the New Jersey thing and the media reporting on it. And I don't blame him again, you know, a no. guy with a young family who is in Calgary and doesn't want to uproot them. Sort of like we're talking about with Kadri. Um, and if he is going to uproot them, probably wants to know that so he can do that. I mean, you know, I can't imagine being on the road or whatever. And my partner calling and saying, I'm hearing that we're moving. Should I get packed up? Like that's going to cause a lot of family stress. And, you and I have talked a lot about Jacob Marsham. We don't have to have the discussion again here today, but um, I don't think this guy's going to be a Calgary flame come the start of the season. No, me either. I think there's enough teams. And I think we're going to see some teams, even in the playoffs, who realize they need a goalie. There's not a lot of starters available. And I, I would be surprised, especially if Lillard's healthy. I would be surprised if Markstrom starts the year as a flame. Yeah. And, well, you know, you just have to look at some of the early playoff games, like the Colorado game where, like, their goalie gave up seven goals on, like, 22 shots. Like, um, you know, like, there are going to be teams needing goaltenders. So, you know, um, it, the market will still be there. I'm not expecting a, a huge return for Markstrom, but, you know, like, I'm expecting a return at some point. Well, yeah, I, I mean, you're not going to think... let him walk for nothing, right? You're going to yeah, get like, something for him. And yeah. I think right now is probably the time you're going to get the most for him. Yeah, I don't see uh, there being anything, like any chances really of him being here next year. Uh, with how adequately Wolf played in his rookie season, and you have uh, Vladar, who also looks to be decent you know like for a retooling team like Vladar Wolf is a perfectly adequate goaltending tandem you don't need a Markstrom and like frankly and this is going to sound strange but Markstrom's excellent play is actually a little bit of a not so good thing for this club moving forward in You're terms thinking of that he might be able to move them higher up the standings in a place that they may not want to be well, it also gives, like, the management false expectations, frankly, of the team. It, you know, like, if you, Markstrom didn't play this season for the Flames, like, the Flames probably finished around where Columbus did in, like, with the fourth worst record. And, you know, Markstrom basically up until the trade deadline put up Vesna caliber numbers um, and, you know, was absolutely dynamite until the defensemen all changed and you know like it, it doesn't help the the state of the entire team like when one guy is like solely propping up everybody else and see and i'm he, not even worried about that i mean if you look at marstrom he seems to be good every other year like, true he has that a good too. year a bad year a good year a bad year if you're gonna sell him Sell him on a good year because if we go into next year and either he's not looking good or the defense don't or whatever, you're gonna get a heck of a lot less for him this time. Well, you know, a year. Yeah, you know, like if he plays badly next year, like you would probably have to buy out his final year level of, you know, just to clear the roster spot. And, and I mean, he's 34. We did. Let's be honest here. We did see him get injured this season, right? He was out for a number of games. As you get older, you tend to get injured more, not less. What if we lose this guy and then there's no value in him? Yeah, and like realistically, like even getting a second round pick or equivalent young player isn't a bad value just to clear the roster spot and move forward. And, you know, and I say this as somebody who's a big fan of Markstrom and has liked him since he was a Florida Panther at the start of his career. It, it's just one of those where like the current needs of the organization and the player are not on the same page. And I'm a big fan of Markstrom too. And I'm, I'm a fan of right now what he can get us as a return. Yeah. Right? Like I mean, it, it I hate to say we got to look at these guys, a business asset and the best way to use that business asset right now is to move it. Yeah. And like, realistically, it does not help us or him. Like, he is 34, turning 35. If he wants to vie for a Stanley Cup at any point, like, he needs to get moved to a team that's good. And, you know, time is now, basically. So, you know, uh, I just... Um, 
I how do you say I hate how this all has unfolded over the course of the season and it should have been just a more of a natural you know like at the end of the year you evaluate your goaltending and you move on but you know the media with the whole New Jersey thing threw a big wrench in that and uh, you know like as a fan you know like I hate seeing one of our players going through that kind of an ordeal for no good reason yeah I get what you're saying but you know I'm I think there's talk because it would be such a big move, right? I mean, he's a great goaltender this year. He's a starter. Making a move like that's a big move for the organization. And I think anytime you have a big move like that, there's a lot of talk around it. And, you know, that's part of playing in a Canadian market. So, you know, if he, I hate to say it, but if he doesn't like it, he might be in the wrong spot. Yeah. Um, and, and it's going to happen, right? And especially when a team is rebuilding, I think any of the veterans have to be willing to have that kind of talk happening. Oh, for sure. Matt, were you aware that the Flames had 11 rookies play for their team this year? Makes sense. I mean, nothing says rebuild like having you know that many guys in the, in the lineup. So let's just recap them all. Um, and I'll sort of order them by, I think, the one that made the most impact the least. And you tell me if you agree. I think first I'd put Connor Zari, 34 points in his rookie year, three game-winning goals. That's about 0.69 um, game score if you follow game score. But, um, you know, he, he had a pretty impactful rookie season. Yeah, uh, he's definitely trending to be a high-quality third-line player with the possibility of more. Um, this was the first year he's been healthy in a long while, so... Hopefully he can uh, just use what he learned this year and build on it and maybe cement himself as a top six forward moving forward. He was called up on the 31st and never looked back. Um, right after him on November 3rd, Marty Pospisil, 24 points in 63 games in his rookie season. Um, he played the same number as Zari. Again, I think a guy who's figured out what his role is, a guy none of us had pegged probably to be a call this year, but... I think, you know, these are now guys that will be here next year, both of them. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I have a concern with with Pospisil is uh, potential regression like uh, Walker Dewar had. But even um, if he regresses, I think he regresses to like a fourth line standard and he's still got a spot. True. Um, it'll be interesting to see. And, uh, you know. Um, I mean, if he takes the Walker Dewar spot and he can be a better Walker Dewar, that's still a spot these guys need. Yeah, true. It'll be just interesting to see exactly uh, if he's like, what do you see is what you get, or if there's more there, there. Um, Matt Coronado was the next one, and we know he's been up, he's been down, he's been everywhere. Um, I would say near the end of the year, he looked like he was clicking, but. A guy who still, I think, has some development that needs to happen, whether in the American League or the NHL. I think I would be hard-pressed to believe he won't make the team out of camp next year, but I think that he's still a few years away from hitting his kind of his NHL potential. Well, his decision-making and just overall um, adaptability to plays as they happen need the pace needs to get higher for him and like there are so many chances and opportunities where like he just was behind the play and um he needs to work on his skating uh you know like uh, frankly like if he doesn't improve in a lot of ways like you know he might be a player that's hard pressed to stick in the nhl i think they'll find him a spot I don't know if it'll be a top six spot, but I think they'll find him a spot. Yeah, I agree. It's just one of those where, how would you say, he was drafted very highly due to the caliber of his shot, which is top notch, but... Um, there's, there's work to do to flush out the game. Yeah, like there, there's a lot of other aspects where he needs to improve on, and decision-making and pace needs to be two of them if he wants to stick. Yep. So the NHL defines a rookie as anyone under 25 who's playing over 25 games. Like as soon as you play 25 games, you're not a rookie. So technically, Braden Pacall is in that category. He's 24. He played 33 games with the Flames and 17 with Vegas, which puts him at 50 games this year. He's not flashy, but he's a consistent player. You know what you've got there. Um, he'll be back next year. I think it would be – I don't see any way that he's not in the top seven next year. 
Yeah. Uh, to me, he's basically Dennis Gilbert, but younger with upside. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's I, I would love to see that written in a scouting report. Like a guy that we have, but better. Yeah. Well, how would you say um, just solid, but unremarkable in terms of like, you're not going to see him throwing the huge hit or scoring tons of goals or anything like that. No, and I don't He's think he has very a lot of, steady. I don't think he has a lot of upside from here. Like, I think what Braden Bacall we see is what Braden Bacall is going to be. Yeah, like, he might develop into a really good number six, um, which would be excellent, frankly, for this team. Yep. Uh, next guy on the list, we won't spend a lot of time talking about him. We've done that. Dustin Wolf, 17 games, 3.16 goals against. Dustin Wolf got more games than we both predicted. We'll talk about that when we get to our predictions. To me, he showed that he can be an NHL goaltender next year. Can he play 45, 50 games? I don't know, but I think this is a guy you can rely on for you know at least 30 starts next year. Uh, one of my favorite goalies in the, the NHL is UC Soros, and basically Wolf and Soros' first season were, in my mind, a very similar in terms of on-ice play. Um, and, you know, numbers be damned, like, you kind of don't pay too much attention to, like, the three-plus goals against average, you know... Based on like how he's yeah playing most in the games. Of, most of Wolf's goals came after the defense was decimated or most yeah. of his games sorry came after it was decimated so he got a lot more goals against yeah and it's one of those like looking at how he you know he's looking like an NHL starter even though it's his rookie year and it, it's one of those he just needs to get more experience improve slightly get more composed and just you know, keep going. And yeah, uh, it took Saros a couple of years in order to become the starter in Nashville, but he's now one of the top goalies in the league. And I think that Wolf is very much on the, that track and trajectory. It's just going to take a bit. Next guy is uh, Jacob Peltier. We know that he was penciled into a starting a spot on the lineup. He had his shoulder injury that kept him out for several months, came back, never seemed to fully have returned to his game and then he got re-injured um against jacob truba and now he's playing for the wranglers and i think this guy is very similar to what we're talking about with coronado he's got the potential if he can put it together if he can get out of this injury and back to what they expect from him he can have an nhl spot but matt we i think every team has somewhere in their history that young guy who got hurt and never went back to 100 percent. and i worry that could be peltier here yeah, and it'll be interesting to see. And, like, by no means is next year, like, the make-or-break year, but it pretty much also is uh, for the player. And, you know, he needs to find a way to cement himself in the lineup now and, you know, be an effective third-line guy like uh, Connor Zari was for this team. And, you know, like, actually bring it game in, game out. And... You know, he's also in danger of falling by the wayside. And if like, he's not able to make the team out of camp next year, I think that they, he loses his spot in the depth chart. Oh, for sure. And like, this is part of where, like, I, I was saying before we got to this section, that like, I don't really see a top end guy currently um, from the Flames prospect cupboards because, like, guys like Peltier and like Coronado and Hanzig have all either had injury troubles or kind of hit a wall as they move, are moving up in uh, their various organizations and it, you know it's one of those where you know you kind of blunt their you know the likely potential based off of that and like you know, you begin to worry that, like, none of those three guys will be a full-term NHL guy moving forward. And, you know, it is a concern. Yeah, but at the same time, I think the Flames have time to let them work their way into it. It's not like we need these guys to be top six forwards next year. As long as I think both uh, Coronado and Peltier are on the NHL roster, 
and we're seeing that progression i think that's what you need next year oh i agree it, it's just one of those where um the long-term viability of those players like they they need to start showing more uh frankly uh because like with the flames having so many draft picks in each of the next three drafts it, like if they don't step up there are going to be people on their heels really quick i agree and we'll just quickly run through the rest of this list here we won't stop and talk about all of them unless there's somebody specific that you want to mention uh Ilya soliev played 10 games for the flames Nikita Hochuk played nine games and 43 in San Jose. So he's now, I mean, played more than 50 or I guess just over 50 games. Uh, Adam Klapka, six games, one goal, one point. Cole Schwint, four games. Uh, Jan Kuznetsov, one game and no points. So that's the Flames rookies for the year. Um, Of the last batch that you mentioned, the only guy that I thought fit well in the NHL uh, over the term of the games that they played was Ilya Soloviev. Um, and like he looked in the much of a similar vein as Pahal um, or Gilbert, like we're just a steady number six, seven guy. And the rest of them though, just kind of were there and didn't really stand out in any meaningful way. The Flames have a lot of sort of tweener defense right now with Pakal, with Ohochuk, with, uh, with um, I guess you could put Mirmanov in there, with Joel Hanley. I think you may see Solovia back in the American League next year just because of a numbers game. Oh, for sure. And I think the, the good reasoning for going out and getting as many guys as that they did, that it gives an internal competition of, hey, we have three spots available have fun you know and you know if you want the spot you can take it and you just have to beat the guy next to you and enough of them to be in the top three of what's left and even with the flames maybe taking a step back next year then there's still value in some cases to being a top pair guy in the american league the third pair guy in the national league oh i agree and it's one of those where like, I don't think that the Flames are going to go out and get a free agent defenseman this year, but, like, at least right away. But I think that, you know, as, like, as soon as, like, training camp hits, like, if uh, none of the players are standing out, you might see some waiver claims, like uh, the AJ Greer uh, situation. I think they need to find someone they're top four. I think M- Mackenzie Weger, Anderson, Shillington, I don't think Miramanov is a top four guy, so I think you need one more seasoned defenseman there and that's quite possible as well i just don't know like if they're gonna sign that guy necessarily in july or wait for you know um training camp etc or it could even be somebody you're bringing in from another team as a cap dump yep all of those make sense well matt should we look back at our season predictions for this year it's not going to be pretty, everybody. <laughs> Back before the season started, as we do every season, um, we predicted what we thought was going to happen. And we first did these predictions uh, September, late September um, is when we did these. Actually, I think October 1st was, it looks like, the time that we finished them up. So we, ma- we made predictions on 17 different things this year. Let's. Uh, we need like a '90s flashback harp, like in a sitcom when they would flashback. But let's take a look at how we did, shall we? Question number one: Will Jonathan Huberto be at least a point a game player? Uh, you and I both said yes, which would mean he had to be an 82 game player. He ends the year with 52 points, even worse than his disappointing season last year. Well, we were kind of hoping that he would bounce back under Savard and Huska, and. Um... That didn't really happen except for a couple of weeks in January. So, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, to be fair to him, uh, Jeff Skinner, when he first got to Buffalo, was, like, relegated to their fourth line for a couple of seasons and then has bounced back and has been one of their better players of late. So just because, like, Huberto's had a couple of really bad years... Um, does not necessarily indicate that he will continue to be bad. And uh, I think, you know, having a full season with guys like Sharon Govich and uh, Kuzmenko 
will help him in terms of his own creativity on the ice. And I think with the Flames going a bit of a different direction than when he was acquired, I don't know that it's as imperative that he is that guy anymore. True. And... Well, like, frankly, you'd hope that uh, the team would be able to build up enough value in him that, you know, like, he's close to being the 10 ish million dollar player instead of basically being like a four million dollar player masquerading as a ten million dollar player but you know for right now let's be honest the overpayment isn't gonna hurt i mean down the road it will but next year if i was making 10 million isn't gonna affect their cap all that much no it, it's just um uh, more and for he, like and if he four, can help five, if six. he can help build a young guy or something like that I think, you know, right now, I think we've got to be looking one year out in a lot of ways with this team. I think for next year, he's going to be a perfectly serviceable NHLer. I agree. It'll be interesting to see if if and how he bounces back. Question two, will Jacob Markstrom have a bounce back season? We all thought he wasn't a, a great goalie last year, and our definition of a bounce back season was at least a league average starter. I said yes. You said no. I think I won that one. Yeah, I would agree. Um, he was much more than a league average guy this year. Yeah, like for the first half of the year, he was probably the best goalie in the NHL. So, um, yeah, and realistically, like he was the only reason why the Flames were even remotely close to a playoff spot at the trade deadline. Um, and like if he had been like the previous season's version of Markstrom, like the Flames probably are picking in the top five. I totally agree. Uh, the next question, will Dustin Wolf play more than 10 games for the Flames this year? We didn't necessarily specify starting, but will he play more than 10? We both said no, and he ended up playing 17. So I'm happy to be wrong on that one because it means more development for the young goaltender. Yeah, and I'm thrilled with that development. Like, he need, you know, frankly, organizationally, he's the best player currently in the system. So, you know, doing what's best for him makes the most sense. And I would say probably more injury trouble for both goalies than we anticipated here, and that's why this happened. True. And it's also, you know, like things like that do happen, and at least the Flames had a viable alternative uh, to throw him out there instead of just riding the other guy blindly. <laughs> or going to Oscar Dansk. Yeah. Nothing against Oscar Dance, but you wouldn't have got the same results. No. Question four. Will Chris Tanev play 60-plus games? We didn't specify as a flame, so he played 56 games with the Flames, 19 with the Stars in the regular season. The concern when, when this question was posed was we know that he has a tendency to get hurt. So I would say I said no, you said yes. We'll give you this one because he did play more than uh, 60 games. Yep, and he's doing fairly well with Dallas, uh, really stabilizing their defense score as they uh, are vying for the cup. So, and I, I frankly, uh, that uh, in the at least for the first round, like the the Dallas Stars are the team I'm cheering for the most. So, you know, the only thing I don't like about the first round is the fact that the two teams that Calgary has conditional sort of trades with are playing against each other. Yeah. You know, like know, either way, the Flames are going to lose out on something. I know. I, I really wish that uh, the roles had been reversed and uh, Dallas was playing L.A. and Vegas was playing Edmonton in round one. Um, just because you're likely going to see Edmonton in the conference finals because I do not see Vancouver being able to beat them uh, or L.A. And uh, what whoever gets there between Dallas, Colorado, or Winnipeg is just going to manhandle the Oilers. Yeah, I can I can see that. I well, let's get through this before we talk too much about playoffs. If you want to go there, I uh, if anybody wants to hear my playoff predictions, I was on the Shifts and Pucks podcast with our buddy Kevin, and we talked a lot about them there. So I'll reserve mine for for that. But if we got some time, we can chat playoffs at the end. Yep. Um, who's gonna have a breakout season for the Flames? You and I both suggested it be Matt Coronado, and as we talked about earlier, um, I think he had a good development season, but definitely not a breakout season. At least. Not for the Flames. No, and realistically, you know, he needed to adjust to playing a full season uh, instead of the NCAA schedule where it's only like 38 games. Um, 
it, it's one of those that, you know, you, you just hope that next season he actually has made those adjustments and, like, you see, you know, the good player that the Flames drafted more so than the player that struggled for, like, 95% of the season. Yeah, and, you know, he had a great season in the American League. If we look at his stats, he played 41 games at 15 goals and 27 assists for 42 total points. So, you know, looking good in the American League, we could say breakout season there, but definitely not in the in the NHL, but we'll see how he moves forward. Who will struggle this season? I had two names. I had Jacob Markstrom and Elias Lindholm. I think um, I'm, I'm not going to give myself a half point for the fact that Lindholm has struggled since he went to Vancouver. Um, but Mark Markstrom definitely did not struggle here. You thought it would be Andrew Manjapani. I'll give you a point for that. Yeah. <laughs> Manjas. I mean, and you've talked about the fact that maybe they move Manjapani in the off season. Um, I, I think something has to change there because uh, honestly, Manjip frankly, you know, at this point, just to free up a roster spot, I would not be opposed to buying them out just to clear the roster spot for somebody else. Like, it would only be $2 million for each of the next year and uh, two years. So, like, it's not a big cap hit if we decide to go that route. I, I just think that, like, he has been consistently bad since uh, he signed the contract. And, you know, frankly, realistically, the Flames need to use the roster spot for a better player. If Trilliving was here, I'd say no, because I think Trilliving was high on this guy with a new regime. I could see it possibly happening. Yeah, because like I don't think that there will be many teams lining up to trade for him. I think you'd have to give somebody something to take him. Yeah, because the $6 million on the one-year deal seems like a lot, but uh, buying him out, it's only a third of the cap hit for two years. Uh, you know, And like, right now the Flames can afford that. Well, and realistically, like if Manjapani was playing like a four million dollar player, it wouldn't be a problem. But he's basically playing like a, a million and a half to two million dollar player. And I would say if they didn't have Huberto on the books, they could probably afford that one bad deal. But I think right now with Huberto with Manjapani, you've got to shed one of the veteran deals that's not you know living up to where it should be, and he's the easier one to shed. Yeah, and it, it's one of those that, like, also this team needs to transition away from what was and build something new. And just clearing out a roster spot, I think, is better for the organization than keeping the player. See what happens there. Yep. Uh, question seven, who will pleasantly surprise us? I said Nikita Zadorov. You said Walker Dewar. Matt, is it fair to say that I was pleasantly surprised by the return for Nikita Zadorov? Uh, well... How would you say he played well until we he traded did. him he did. <laughs> and then uh, he vanished into the ether in Vancouver and uh, never to be heard from again. Should but we give me a half point for that one? I think a third of a point. I think the flames were able to get a good return because he looked good for them. He was a little more outspoken. Than I thought any of us thought he would be at this point. Um, and, and I think, you know, that may have hurt his value. Uh, may have helped, who knows? But yeah, I think he they got a good return because he was playing well. Yeah, and Walker Dewar uh, on the other great, hand, I'm just grateful for the assets that we got for him. And you know, uh, honestly, you know, utilizing one of the two draft picks that we got for him uh, to get Ohotiuk was you know perfectly fine because you basically replaced the third pairing defenseman with another third pairing defenseman and. You know, at least this guy will be with the team for a couple of years. Walker Dewar, on the other hand, I mean, he looked pretty good last year. It's sort of a surprise, but uh, I don't think yeah, he makes he, the National he, Hockey League with the Calgary Flames next year. Yeah, he just had a Josh Juris, like, couple of years where the one year he was awesome, the second year he was there, and I don't think there's going to be a third year to that. No, I don't either. I mean, I can see him still being in the organization, but I think he, if he is in the organization, he's uh, suiting up for the Wranglers next year. And if he's not in the organization, unless he goes to a worse team, I don't think they he will be a National Hockey League player. Unless he yeah. can somehow find his way to Anaheim or uh, San Jose or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, who will be the Flames' top point getter for the Flames or for the season? Who do you think we said? Uh, no idea. 
We both said Jonathan Huberto, and the top point getter is Nazem Kadri. After 82 games, he has 29 goals, 46 assists for 75 total points. Right behind him was Sharon Govich at 59. So we're both taking a big loss in that one. We expected Huberto to bounce back. Yeah, to be at least what uh, Kadri was this year. And, you know, uh, that didn't happen, frankly. And, yeah. <laughs> We've talked about him. We won't talk about him again. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Who will be the first call-up? This is always one of my favorite questions every year. I, I think this is kind of interesting to predict how this is going to go. You and I always predict a forward and a defense in this. So we were both right on defense. The first defenseman called up was Soloviev, and we both predicted him. We both had the same group of forwards, and we were both wrong, unfortunately. Uh, we said it was going to be either Klapka or Schwint, and it ended up being Zari. Yep. So again, I'm happy to be wrong on that because Zari came up and did really well. Oh, for sure. And it's one of those that, you know, when you're wrong and it ends up that somebody came out of nowhere really and surprised, like the coaching staff did not expect that level of play from Zari at any point uh, this year. And he came in and was a mainstay th throughout the whole season. Uh, so, yeah, good to be wrong on that one. The next one feels terrible to be wrong about. Do the Flames win the Battle of Alberta? And we both said no, and we're right. Yeah. That that one stings every year. Well, just takes all us in the fact that they're going to likely get creamed in the playoffs. So. Um, do the Flames win the Battle of... Or do the Flames win the Heritage Classic? And as we know, Edmonton ended up winning 5-2. to two. I said no. You said yes. That's not a victory I'm happy to have. Yeah. We were hoping, right? I mean, yeah, it, I was hoping, but I was. It was one of those where it's like, yeah, probably not, but just to not be 100% on the same page, I went the other way, and yeah. <laughs> it's It was an optimistic pick. Yep. Uh, where do the Flames finish the regular season in the Pacific Division? I said second, you said third. Flames not even in the top three, um, not even close. Fifth. So, so we yeah. both take a loss there. Oh. How many regular season points the Calgary Flames end with? The uh, end ended up being eighty-one. I said a hundred. You said ninety-eight. So again, really far off there. Question yeah, it, it, like if the Flames had not traded off everybody, we probably would have been around the ninety-two to ninety-four range. We still would have missed the playoffs, but we would have been at least close. But, yeah. uh, you know. Um, the next question, number 14, how far will the Flames go in the playoffs? Boy, were we optimistic to say they will go far. Uh, I said that they make it to the Western Conference Finals. You said they lose in the first round. You're closer, but uh, we're still both off there. I mean, the Flames yeah. aren't anywhere close to the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Do the Wranglers make the finals this year? I said no. You said yes. We don't know. Right now, they're seventh uh, of eight teams that are going in the Western Conference. A lot of that is because they didn't have as many players down there. I mean, the Flames kept calling guys up, as we talked about. So they were without players for a lot of the playoffs. Now they've got a whole bunch of players, both all guys coming back from the NHL. They've got Sam Honzig joining them. Hunter Bershtavich will be there soon, we think. So a whole platoon of guys joining them, which... I mean, I think it could push them to the finals, but we will have to come back to that one as we get close to the draft. Yeah. Number si number 16, do Ryan Huska or Craig Conroy lose their job? We both said no, and we were right. And the final question, what do the Flames need to do to be successful for this season? Um, I said a second-round win in the playoffs or a massive sell-off of the trade deadline if it's clear we're not where we expected. You said a second round exit or better or a massive sell off if we're not where we expected. And I think we can both take a point for that. The Flames didn't think they were going to be where they wanted to be. They sold off. They got yeah. the assets. And now we've charted a new course based on that. Well, and how would you say it was the optimistic and the realistic? And, you know, if the optimistic happened, then great. Let's go for the playoffs. And the realistic happened where. They were kind of just in that middle, and they did what they had to do by selling off the UFAs, and they yeah. got a good return for everybody. So Imagine if they kept them all, and we missed the playoffs, how upset we'd all be. 
Oh yeah, like it's like, oh well, we just wasted like ten assets for nothing. Well, Great. and probably set the whole rebuild retool back, you know, four or five, four or five years by doing that. Because now you got what? Now you're relying on getting value from Markstrom and Manjipani. Yeah, as like your saving grace for your. Yeah, like it would have just been a complete gong show if they hadn't sold off everybody, and it's good that they did. And, you know, now we have a bunch of guys to look forward to, both from draft day and uh, the young guys that they acquired in the trades. And speaking of draft day, Matt, I think we're probably done now until close to the draft. We don't know exactly when our next show will be, but uh, enjoy the playoffs. Follow us on social media. We will post there when we're going to have a show, but we will do the, we'll go kick it old school. We haven't done it for the last couple of years, but we'll do a, a more in-depth draft recap. Matt's our lead scout on that. You're like our, uh, our Craig Button. You're our lead scout, and Matt will be breaking down some of the guys that might be there for us. It'll be sometime in June. We don't know when, but we will yeah. let everybody know as we get closer. Well, and especially with the Flames having a likely ninth overall selection, there's going to probably be about eight or ten guys that will profile for uh, contenders for that draft pick. Plus, you know, uh, picking again uh, near 30th and... Um, another pick in the 30s or early 40s as well uh like there will be a bunch of guys in the back half of the first round that the will be previewing as well as guys to look forward to for our second first round pick with vancouver and our own second round pick uh in the second round as well so we'll be i don't i don't uh, think we actually have the lottery date yet but it's usually in early may yeah, and realistically, like, the Flames have, like, a 5% chance of winning the lottery, so not likely going to happen, um, and just as likely to be picking 10th or 11th as we are um, winning the thing. So uh, whenever the uh, draft lottery happens, if, when they get to 9, if you don't see the Flames logo, then we'll be picking 1st or 2nd. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, not a ton to talk about. And I, I think that, uh, you and I'll have some fun with our draft preview show on talking, do we get a Ginla or do we go elsewhere? <laughs> a Ginla or not a Ginla? That is the question. Yes. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much wraps things up. I wish we were going later into the spring, but we're not. So everybody enjoy the playoffs. It's going to be a fun playoff this year, I think. Lots of interesting matchups. And I will talk to you again in June. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.